Harry's got enough shit to deal with without you making jabs at his... The one thing he's proud of, to call the one thing he's proud of is an abnormality. Not that he's, like, super surprised that it's happening, but, I don't know. Vernon's a dick. I ponder if it makes it more or less difficult now that at least he knows why they're the assholes that they are. That we've that it's been established now. He's magical and he's a wizard, and so now he kind of knows why they freak out about things. But does it make it any easier, really, for him, or is it still just shitty because they treat him so shitty? I think it'd still be shitty because either way, he still has to sit there through all that time and like verbal abuse. And I think it's probably still a little bit confusing because Petunia lost a sister that's that's still his aunt right and she treats him like dog shit and i think that's jealousy well yeah i mean i think it is too but i don't think that harry has probably made that connection as a 12 year old kid that it's all due to petunia wanting to be magic because they act like they hate it the magic the ministry of magic doesn't like the muggles knowing of the magic world very clearly they know that the dursleys are very aware of everything now why don't they go in and obliviate their memory of the magic world and allow harry to have a normal childhood rather than the shithole he lives in and or just in general do it due to the fact that they're not supposed to know of it in in the beginning well i think that they in general there are a lot of muggle-borns that come from muggle families that they would have to obliviate if they were just concerned with muggles knowing because if you have a child generally i think that they think that you're not going to treat the child that you're taking care of like that I, we've we've established that we think that Dumbledore was keeping an eye on on Harry this whole time. Yeah, but I in, know he has been. Here we go. <laughs> he didn't have a chocolate frog card when he was growing up. All he needs is a no. picture frame. <laughs> no. He didn't have a picture frame. He had nothing. <laughs> Just saying. So, as far as the Ministry of Magic was concerned. This family was just taking care of a baby, and they had no reason to assume that they were actually ostracizing him for being magic his whole life. Especially because they hadn't mentioned magic to him for his whole life. They had just been trying to stamp it out of him. I kind of like James's point, though. The whole thing is that they don't want muggles to even know. Not necessarily that they wouldn't be taking care of the kid, but, like, it's just the knowledge that any of this even exists is too much for the ministry. So wouldn't they, I guess, no, I guess they wouldn't want to, like, take a baby from a family and just have your baby disappear. But, yeah, I could see that being a problem for the ministry. Well, there are plenty of muggle-borns that, like, that's such a grander scale, like... No, they don't want muggles as a whole to know about the wizarding world because they'll ask for magical cures and all that. But magical, like, muggle families, like, individually can know because they aren't going to blow the cover of the one wizard in their family. And if they are, the ministry would probably be alerted to that problem and deal with it. All some very interesting theories. So Harry really misses Hogwarts. He has apparently not been able to send messages at all. All of his shit's locked up under the stairs. And the reason that Hedwig is locked up is because Vernon doesn't want him sending messages out to anybody. My question was, because it mentions his broom, and it mentions how he's like, "Who? what do the Dursleys care if I lose my spot on the Quidditch team for practicing? Where would he have practiced anyways? Without people seeing him. Right. You can't just be flying around your backyard. Like, where, what do you think you're going to be doing? Like, how are you going to do this and not be seen? Right. I could think of a lot of things you could do with that magic cloak and the flying broom. Now, that's a good point. (laughs) (laughs) That's a good point. I forgot about his cloak. Well, I know one thing I would do if I had the invisibility cloak. What's that name? I'd go get me some beer. Is it time for the beer break? I do believe that it is. Oh, yay! 
Hey! Beer break! <laughs> this is Brew Detroit's uh, Yum Town. It's American lager with Michigan tart cherries and lime. It's 4.7%. And it smells interesting. Oh, I like it. Oh, there's a lime taste in there. It's refreshing. It's limey. Yeah. It's limey. Let me see the can. What are they going for here? They just say with Michigan tart cherries and lime. That's all they say. There's... So it's it's cherry limeade. Yeah, that's what I thought it was going to taste like, but it doesn't taste like cherry limeade. Not to me. It kind of smells like Mountain Dew. It does. It smells like Mountain Dew. That's what got me. I was like, what the hell? Which... It's... Sorry. <laughs> I was going to say, which I can see because Mountain Dew, I think, has lime in it, doesn't it? Or is it orange juice? No, it, well, both. It's a lemon both. lime. It is. With some orange juice in it. Okay. Um, but this is, it's it's definitely limey and it's tart. I'm not getting a lot of the cherry coming through. No. So it must have been just a little light squeeze of them, but it's, it's all right. I can drink it. You know, I do like it. It is tart. I think that's why I wasn't crazy about it at first, but the more I sip it, it's it's pretty sweet, and I do like it. <laughs> the more you sip it, the more you can drink it. That's pretty true of any alcohol, though. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am a lover of lime, so this is this is spot on for me. I like this. But yeah, I think this was a good beer. I'm, I, that was a good pick, Jadie. Thank you. Next summer, you gotta add it to your summer bevy list. I do have a summer bevy list, and this is going at the top. This is this is Tubin beer right here. It's light and refreshing. I I know. Take a pause for sadness because we did not go tubing this year. Pour some out. Just kidding. Don't pour some out. No, <laughs> I mean we're not. We're going to hypothetically pour some out for our tubing trip that did not happen. We could still probably get away with a camping trip though. Yeah, we could. We could bring beer camping. Yes, we can. <laughs> Can't go camping without it. You cannot. So we are going to get back to you guys after this, and uh, we're going to refill our glasses once or twice more. And we're back! So at this point in the chapter, J.K. Rowling does a little bit of a recap, um, and I'm not doing that. If you need a recap, then I suggest you go binge the last... 17 episodes of All the Things Harry Potter, because we do a very wonderful job of recapping the whole book. <laughs> Good call, J.D. <laughs> um, uh, I do want to mention green eyes and untidy hair are mentioned again. I looked at a whole bunch of pictures of Daniel Radcliffe like as I was reading this, and in none of the movies does that motherfucker have untidy hair or green eyes. Or black hair, for that matter. It's all fucked up. And we're not going to go into comparisons for the whole book, but I have to mention that that is, like, the description over and over of our main character. They could have mussed his hair up, at the very least. Preach. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's Harry's 12th birthday, and he's never really been given a, a gift or a cake. And so, when Vernon says it's a big day, he gets excited at first, and then... Realizes that he's referring to the dinner party. Yeah, he's like, what? No, he can't be serious. <laughs> and then he made it very clear that he was serious, just not about his birthday at all. At all. So they end up running through the plans for the evening. And I think that this is a really funny scene. Oh, I, I was laughing hysterically to myself about this whole thing. <laughs> because it's... Very much me. <laughs> I'm very OCD like that. And I could totally see myself doing something like that to the minute of like, we're going to stand here. Then we're going to say this. And then we're going to go walk gracefully into the next room. And yeah. <laughs> so kind of it was laughing at myself a little bit. But yeah, I, I can see I can see that. It was pretty hilarious. The only time I'm that crazy is when I'm playing a vacation. But the funniest part, I thought, was Harry repeating the whole, I will be in my room, making no noise, and pretending I'm not there. And <laughs> just him repeating, like, by the third time he said it, it, it just kills me every single time I read it. <laughs> Did you read it 
with a sarcasm by the end of it, like I was reading it. Yeah. Because in my head, Harry was getting snarky. Yeah. He's he's got attitude, especially because by the end of it, he's laughing, un- literally laughing under the table at Dudley about the whole. I wrote an essay about you, Mister Mason, and how you're my hero. And Petunia's crying, and Harry's laughing, but he's like, "I'll be in my room, making no noise and pretending I'm not there." He's probably pretty glad to not have to be a part of that whole circus going on in the dining room, right? Like, yeah, I know it sucks that I have to pretend I don't exist on my birthday. And I honestly feel like the first couple of times he said it, he was genuinely sad about it. Because he was just thinking about his birthday. Right. But I agree with you both that that last time around, he's like, this is just ridiculous. And he was laughing at the pony show. (laughs) Yeah. So after that, um, Harry ends up going into the backyard singing happy birthday to himself. And it is it is sad, because he has to spend the whole day pretending like he doesn't exist. I mean, most of us have had birthdays that are all centered around us, or we've had the opposite, that aren't. I had to share my birthday with my brother. I fucking hated it. Every year. So, not quite the same level of hating your birthday as Harry has, but I get it. I think we've all had the not-so-great birthdays. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, it ends up mentioning that he misses his friends. He hasn't heard from them all summer, which is kind of weird, because they all promise to send him letters and give him phone calls and be there for him all summer, and he hasn't heard shit from any of them. He didn't tell the Dursleys he couldn't do magic, and he's been teasing Dudley all summer by saying, like, mumbo-jumbo under his breath until he got bored with that, too, because he's depressed. It's obvious he's pretty depressed at this point. See, if they didn't know he couldn't do magic, I still would, like we had said before, I couldn't help it, but I would whip out my wand every time I could. Well, they locked it away. Yeah. Uh, Well, they don't know he can't make a stick into another one. Well, I thought you were going to say they don't know he can't do magic without his wand. That's the question I was going to ask. Okay, so they took his wand. Are they under the impression he has to use his wand to do anything? Because Dudley's obviously not. Right. He thinks he can just say some stuff and it's going to happen. And through his interaction with Hagrid in the last book, he doesn't want any part of that. Also, I kind of feel like Harry is ballsy enough to try to pick that lock when the Dursleys are sleeping. That's true. He'd take a risk. Again, I don't want to go back to movie, but movie Harry's kind of a bitch, so he probably wouldn't. But book Harry, I feel like, definitely would have. No, that's valid. But eventually he got depressed by that, too, and he's like, nah, that's not even fun. And he keeps waking up all summer to dreams about multi-bildy. Hmm. But you can't really blame him because he also... I feel like it's kind of interesting that it doesn't mention that he's having nightmares about murdering the dude that he murdered. By the way, I don't know if anyone remembers that. Harry Potter's murderer. Mm. Yeah, we did question that in the last season. Um, Harry murdered Quirrell. Yup. And it never goes into any detail about how he felt about it, what he maybe thought of it. If he felt guilty from killing a dude. His magical therapy th- sessions that I'm sure he had to go to. Right. <laughs> it was in self-defense, kid. You're okay. <laughs> I- I'm just saying that he definitely should have had at least one therapy session to, like, round out that year. Because murder is kind of a big deal. Get a debriefing, as it were. Right. Exactly. He does. He talks to Dumbledore for that few minutes. Quaid. And gets a whole sum up of what was up and why he had to do what he did. Quirky Dumbledore, who's eating fucking Birdie Bot's beans and <laughs> giving him advice about love shields. I don't feel like that's enough. I mean, apparently it was because that's what happened. But I don't feel like it's really enough. <laughs> Maybe later on he could be tormented. 
I mean, he is. He's having nightmares. Well, clearly he, but not about not him about killing nightmare. someone, about someone coming after him. He never even thinks about Quirrell. 